This is the ultra portable M1 iPad Air, which starts at $600 for the 64 gig version. And this is the M1 iPad Pro, which starts at $800 for the 11 inch 128 gig version. Assuming you settled on the iPad and not another tablet, more on that in another video, assuming you decided on the iPad already, things are getting interesting right now on which version should you go for. Why should you pay more for the M1 iPad Pro? Let's have a look. I'm Alex and I do down to earth tech reviews. And I'm here once a week with at least one new video for you. When it was announced last year that the iPad Pro would come with the M1 chip, it felt like the old days of Apple. It was a big surprise to everyone and it promised a lot. I was excited about it. Thing is, in my opinion, Apple are massively sandbagging here in terms of what this device is capable of. The M1 chip is not a standard mobile device chip, right? This chip is capable of running really professional workloads. Now, I'm quite pragmatic when it comes to these things and I realize that the thermal footprint here is a limitation, but Apple and their partners could do a little bit more, in my opinion, to make this device truly more pro. But they do want us to buy their MacBook Pros as well. So anyway, this brings us to the iPad Air. Why would you pay more for the M1 iPad Pro when in reality the M1 iPad Air can do pretty much everything else that the Pro can do? There's definitely good reasons to buy the M1 Pro, don't get me wrong, but let's take a look because I think for the majority of people the iPad Air is actually going to be a better buy overall. When it comes to weight and dimensions on the 11 inch, both are virtually the same weight. I think it will only matter if you're comparing the 12.9 inch Pro, but between the 11 inch iPad Pro and the iPad Air, they're basically the same weight. The 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro is lovely. I, I love that and, and it's my go-to device to work anywhere. But when I'm given the option to pick the iPad Air, just to lounge on the sofa or just to take it to a cafe, recently the iPad Air has been the one that I, I take. To me at least, it ticks all the boxes when it comes to portability. I never do any intensive work on the M1 iPad Pro really. I would if Apple let me. For example, I would use an external monitor and I would edit videos on it if Apple allowed Final Cut to work on it. I'd even accept a cut down version of Final Cut, but in general though, I'd use my iPad Pro much more if Apple allowed me to use more Pro apps. So the iPad Air right now is actually great for most things that I do. If I'm editing photos and I really want to kind of look at the finer details, then I'd probably still pick the M1 iPad Pro, but the difference there is only marginal. When it comes to convenience, the iPad Air is just much more convenient with the Touch ID. Touch ID is awesome and probably one of the most underrated features of the iPad Air. I love and it works every time. I still don't understand why Apple didn't give us Touch ID on the iPad Pro. They've had this feature since the iPad Air now, right? The previous iPad Air. So it's beyond me really why, why not? Face ID is okay, but when you're using the tablet handheld, it makes it difficult to unlock and it personally, just I end up just typing my password which is very 1990s. Very unusual from Apple to do something so cumbersome in my opinion. If you've watched other iPad Air videos, build quality could be a concern for you. As others have mentioned, the build quality on the iPad Air is a little questionable and some people are experiencing some movement and creaking. I do drop things like my S22 Ultra here, which has smashed the screen recently, but I don't tend to twist my iPad on purpose or use it as a tennis racket. So I think it might be just one of those things that it's been over exacerbated by people like me on YouTube. If you're moving lots of files between cameras and the iPad, for example, and you care about transfer speeds, then the M1 iPad Pro will be a better option because that has support for Thunderbolt, which the iPad Air doesn't. It's still USB-C instead of Lightning, which is great but it's just not as fast as Thunderbolt. When it comes to the display, if I'm watching content or editing photos, as I said before, the M1 iPad Pro has the edge and is the one that I'd go for because of that better display. Using something like Adobe Lightroom on the iPad Pro is an absolute delight. But the experience on the M1 iPad Air is also fantastic. You know, it, it doesn't, doesn't really give anything away and it's actually not that noticeable unless you're really going looking for it and start pixel peeping. In terms of color accuracy, they're both identical. I have to be honest, I don't see any difference here. They also both have the same anti-reflective coating and the resolution is only marginally different as the iPad Air is a 10.9 inch display as opposed to the 11 inch on the M1 iPad Pro. Of course, you can go for the 12.9 inch version of the iPad Pro, which is what I did, but the brightness on the iPad Air at 500 nits is very similar to the 11 inch iPad Pro, which is 600 nits. When it comes to audio, the speakers on the M1 iPad Pro are still mind blowing to me. There is a better tablet in town when it comes to audio quality, and I will cover that in another video, but the M1 iPad Pro definitely packs a punch here on the speakers. There is no way I can replicate the quality here on YouTube, but let's try and have a listen and see how they compare.
Okay, so that was the M1 iPad Pro. I thought the M1 iPad Pro is still a beast when it comes to the audio. And the M1 iPad Air is not a slouch, but it's a little bit teenier. When it comes to the cameras, I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about the iPad cameras because they're fine. And I know you don't care. You probably use your phone anyway, right? But if you're a student, you might want to take photos of lectures and things like that with the iPad. Either option has a 12 megapixels wide lens, which is fine. Now, what really makes the iPad experience more enjoyable for me and arguably more complete are the accessories. The Magic Keyboard is probably the most expensive keyboard you'll ever buy, but it is pretty special. I love my mechanical keyboard and I've been in love with the Logitech Craft Keyboard as well recently, but there's something really pleasing about typing on the Magic Keyboard. And if you're used to typing on a MacBook laptop, the transition here is pretty seamless. The Magic Keyboard on the iPad Air though is slightly smaller, but honestly, the experience is almost the same. My typing is only ever so slightly delayed on the iPad Air, but that's more because of my sausage fingers. Also, I'm not keen on the camera cutout here, it could be my OCD, but feels a bit lazy from Apple. Then you've got the pen, of course, which is still very responsive and lovely to use. And it works with both iPads interchangeably in case you have more than one. That's such an underrated accessory, I think. I have the pen tips as well, which makes it even easier to use. I'll leave a link to them down below if you're interested, but they really help kind of remove that glass and slippery feel that you get on the normal without any tips. One bugbear of mine is that it doesn't support Find Me. It, trust me. I lose this Apple Pen at least once a week. These are great, Alex, but what about accessories outside of the Apple world? Well, I didn't want to clutter this video with lots of iPad accessories, but I've already done a few videos on iPad accessories that you should check out, and I'll leave a playlist for you at the end. But just a couple of very special mentions to this beautiful stand from Satechi here. It looks like it was made by Apple themselves, and the Thunderbolt 4 hub from OWC. I'll leave links to them and the reviews I did on them as well. I'm really happy with the performance on this hub, how compact it is and everything. So they really help with keeping your setup very clean. Battery life on both the M1 iPad Pro and the iPad Air have been fantastic for me. There's no issues there. Can any of these be your main computer? Sure, but it will depend on what you do with it, of course. The iPad Air has strong computer performance in a very small form factor. It is the ultimate tool for people on the road I can see lots of students, uh, state agents, and various other professionals taking the iPad Air and replacing a whole lot of junk and weight and clutter from their bags. What don't I like about these devices? Very simple for me. On the iPad Air, 64 gig is a joke. Come on, it's 2022. I love using dongles and cloud storage, but I feel 256 gig or even 512 gig for me would make the iPad Air a much more powerful device. On the iPad Pro, there's a lot of things that I don't like, almost like a rant here, but the main one is a 16 gig version. I don't see a reason to buy that. It's a massive report for me. I'd love to hear though, if you are using 16 gig of RAM on the current M1 iPad Pro and, and you're seeing any difference, I'd love to hear that use case. And you might be thinking, but I want some future proofing, Alex, you know, I don't wanna be buying an iPad every time Apple releases a new one. Well, you might have a point, but I think they do last a long time. And the Air, unlike the iPad 9, for example, already has some future proof in it. It has the M1 chip after all. But if you're looking for more power, then watch this playlist here where I cover the M1 iPad Pro and lots of accessories that you will find very useful. And don't forget to subscribe as I will be covering lots of content on tablets and accessories. And I'll see you and your smiling faces on the next one.